This is called the parable of the talents, or another title for it is the parable or the story of the three servants. The three servants. You know, Jesus was a master storyteller. And I, I, one of the reasons why his stories are so compelling, he knew that stories were a way to reach people right where they're living. Because he always tells a story about reality of life where people who are uh, listening to Jesus says, oh, I can relate to that because I know somebody who's doing that or I know somebody who's gone through that. Or in a society like Jesus, he knew what they were living through and going through. And Jesus helped people see themselves in the story, gain a greater understanding about life, gain a greater understanding about God, about who God is and how God operates in our lives, and then a greater understanding about themselves and how I need and you need to respond to God when he puts his call on your life. So I want to start with a new story this week, and I'd like you to bow your heads with me for a moment of prayer. Heavenly Father, we love these stories. They speak to us. Uh, we see ourselves in some of the characters of the story. And hopefully, Father, we see ourselves in some of the best characters. Lord, when it comes to the story today, we want to see ourselves in the first two servants, not the third servant. So, Lord, help us to figure out how to be that, uh, either the servant with the five talents or the servant with two talents. Lord, help us to focus on all you've given us so that we can uh, go out and bless this world in a way that reaches them for you. God, we pray that your Holy Spirit will be here among us and, and teach us and, and quicken us, quicken our hearts and minds to capture the truth and to put it into practice and to become more like your son. That's the aim of our lives, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I want to I wanna talk to you just for a moment as I open up about a fantasy a uh, dream come true game show. And uh, I, it may sound a little stereotypical, but I, I really want the women to perk up when I'm telling about this game show because here's this game show. Can you imagine if this game show actually happened to you? Um, you're given, on, on the game show, each contestant is given $10,000 and your job, this is your job for the show. I mean, you don't have to answer a bunch of hard questions. Your job is to go on a shopping spree and spend the entire $10,000. Anybody, anybody up for that? I, I'll be on the show, right? And, but here's the catch. The more money you spend, the more money you spend from that bank account that you're given the $10,000, the more money you spend, the more money gets put into your account. So let's say you spend the whole $10,000. Well, the next time you check your account, there's $20,000 in the account. Go on a shopping spree, spend all the money, and you're thinking, I can do that. 10000 was a good start, so now you go and you spend the $20,000, and then you go check your bank account, and now there's $30,000 in your bank account, and you're getting really excited, and you just keep on shopping, um, and then you go back, and you see that more and more are in, uh, more and more money's in your account. Now, some of you people, uh, whether it's ladies or anybody who just likes to be a, quote, shopaholic, um, would you almost think that you'd died and gone to heaven? I mean, that's a, pretty good, <laughs> that's a pretty good game show to be on. How is it true? The more you spend, the more gets put into your account. Are you kidding me? What kind of world is that? Well, I want to use this story as a parallel because I believe the parallel is found here in Jesus' teaching. We find it here in Jesus' story of the talents that could also be called the story of the three servants. So let's look at this story together, shall we? It's found in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 25. If you have a Bible in, in front of you on the pew racks, you can look up Matthew 25, the first book in the New Testament, or you can follow along on the screen. And the beauty of our live streaming audience is now they can see what's on the screen. So this is really cool. Doesn't mean stop going to church and watch it at home. <laughs> All right. Here we go. Jesus tells the story and he says, again, the kingdom of heaven can be illustrated by the story of a man going on a long trip. And by the way, in the first century, a long trip could be six months. It could be a year. It could be over a year by the time the master gets back. He called together his servants and entrusted his money to them while he was gone. So the implication is that the master is going to be gone for a long time. And so the servants 
that he obviously has a high degree of confidence in him because he's going to put them in charge of a great deal of finances on his behalf while he's gone. And so I, wanna, I want you to notice, it's not just a long trip. It says he's going to entrust his money. So whose money is it? It's not our money. It's the master's money. He's entrusted it to us. We're the managers of his uh, resources. We're not the owners. And he's entrusted his money to them and he seems to have a lot of confidence based upon how much money he's given him. Because you may not see this uh, at the first reading, but I'll explain it in a minute. He says, he gave five bags of silver or talents to one, two bags of silver to another, and one bag of silver to the last, dividing it in, por in proportion to their ab abilities. He then left on his trip. So he goes away on his trip calls three of his servants, gives differing amounts to each one of the servants. Now, let me explain to you what a talent is. Because if you read the New American Standard or some of these other uh, versions that are more like word-by-word -word translations rather than idea for idea or thought by thought, uh, it'll say this word talent. What is a talent? Well, a talent is originally a measure of weight. And a talent could range anywhere from 50 to 80 pounds. So this, is, this isn't your little bag, you know, uh, of five coins in a bag that weighs about a half a pound. Here you go. Here's, here's what I want you to invest for me. No, he's handing them even a one-talent bag would weigh 50 to 80 pounds. And most likely, because back in the first century, the most common weight of a talent was weighed in silver coins. They were weighed in these silver coins. Each of the coins was worth about a day's wage. And even the one talent could represent a heavy bag of silver that weighed about 75 pounds. It contained about 6,000 of these coins, and a denarius was a normal day's wage. So I did the math. You're talking about 16 years' wages in that bag. And that's one bag that has one talent in it. One servant was given five talents. One servant was given a two-talent bag. So I'll just say... The servant gave them each these big bags of coins full of money that was worth a fortune, right? So here's another observation. It's the owner and God himself, if you didn't know, God himself is represented by the owner in this story. It's the owner who designates and decides who gets what. Now you may say, hey, I want the five talents. Or you may say, ah, that's too much for me. It's too much responsibility. Just give me the two talents. Or I don't even feel worthy of that. Just give me the one talent. It's not up to you to decide. It's up to the owner to decide who gets what. These servants, and by the way, these servants are all entrusted with a great deal of money. But that money is given to them in varying amounts. And it says each according to his ability or in proportion to his ability. And here's my point about God being the owner. God knows us and God knows what we can handle. And, that's, and it's up to him to decide how many resources he's going to give to us. So it's up to God. So let's, let's talk about the first servant. He's the, he's the great one. The first two are our model servants. In fact, if you don't remember anything, you say, be like the first two servants. You know, there's your sermon for the day. Be like the first two guys. You don't want to be the third guy. The servant who received the five bags of silver began to invest the money. In fact, one of the translations says immediately began to invest the money and he earned five more. The servant with the two bags of silver also went to work and earned two more. So both these guys doubled their money. However much money they were given, they doubled it. But the servant who received the one bag of silver, dun, 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 this is the guy you don't want to be. The servant who received the one bag of silver dug a hole in the ground and hid the master's money. Hid the master's money for safekeeping. He had his own reasons for doing so. We're going to find out later on in the story why he did that. So let's just talk about the first servant. It's good to be the first servant. Because after a long time, it says the master returned from his trip and he called them to give an account for how he'd used, how they had used his money. Notice it was not their money, it was the master's money. They were, they were managing, managing the resources on behalf of their master. But he had a lot of confidence in him because he gave him a fortune. 
And that's, I, I, that's what I want you to see. It's not like the master's being stingy here and saying, I'm going to give you a little, a little, be faithful with that. Okay, here's another dollar. Oh, you're faithful with that? Well, here's another quarter. You know, no, he's passing them out massive amounts of money. The servant to whom he had trusted the five bags of silver, so 80 years of wages, this guy comes forward with five more bags and says, Master, you, you gave me five bags of silver to invest, and I've earned five more. The master was full of praise. Well done, my good and faithful servant. And by the way, in your dreams of your life and where your life ends up at the end of your life, I hope you will hear these words. God willing, you're going to hear these words someday. Well done, my good and faithful servant. You've been faithful in handling this small amount. How rich is this master? <laughs> this, you've been faithful in handling this small amount. Oh, 80 years of wages. Good job in handling this small amount. So now I will give you many more responsibilities. He gets a promotion and his promotion is even more responsibilities. Let's celebrate together. So I just have a couple quick observations right, right out the gate with this guy. Number one, when we're given a responsibility, when you have a responsibility given to you by your master Jesus, that responsibility with it always comes accountability. That's where the word accounting comes from, right? You got to count the money, right? Just like our ladies on Monday morning, you either come in to, to count the offering. But, but with that responsibility, when, when Jesus gives you something, there's always an accountability. We're always going to give an account to him for how we handled whatever resources he gave to us. And number two, for the faithful servant, and this is, this is the best thing, and I don't know if you've ever received a reward, if you've ever been given a prize, if you've ever been given a trophy, if you've ever been given a commendation or a promotion or something like that where, you know, you stand up there and you receive some award and everybody's clapping for you. All of, whatever the best award you could have ever received, even if it's the Congressional Medal of Honor, no Award ceremony comes even close to hearing those words, well done by your master Jesus. None of them would even come close. That trumps everything else. There's going to be accountability someday for how we use the resources God gave us. And he's entrusting a great deal to us. And hopefully at the end of our lives, when we come in his presence, he's going to be able to say those words that we're longing for him to say. And that is, well done. Um, isn't it interesting that the reward, the master's reward given to this servant is even more responsibility? That's, what I, that's why I gave you that story about the game show. You go out and take the resources and you spend them all and you advance the kingdom and you're given even more. Even more gets put into your account. To him who has. Do you, you remember when Jesus started telling all these stories and the first story he told was the parable of the sower and the seed, right? And the four different soils. That was the first story we looked at in this series. When Jesus is asked, what do these parables mean? Why are you telling these people all these stories? Why do you do this? And Jesus says, well, for one thing, because whoever's listening and wants to really learn, they're going to clue in, they're gonna get, uh, they're gonna get the idea of what I'm trying to get across. Because they're listening and they wanna listen and hear and obey. Those people, and, and then Jesus says, while telling that story, the ones that have, even more will be given to them. But the ones who do not have, even the small amount they have is going to be taken away. Jesus didn't say that in this story. He said it in the story about the sower and the seed. So to, who, to, he, to him or her who has, even more will be given. Even more responsibilities, even more promotion. They get an A-plus rating for the first servant. So let's talk about the second servant right? First one had five bags of silver. Second servant has two bags of silver, right? The master decided who gets what, gave each person a, a, a certain amount of resources, time, talent, abilities, opportunity, intelligence, whatever uh, what is encapsulated in that word talents, right? All the different ways God has blessed you. And he says, go and do business, go and occupy the New American Translation says in Luke's version of this story, occupy until I come. So we're, we're trying to advance the master's cause with the, it, with the resources he gives us. The servant who had received two bags of silver came forward and said, Master, you gave me two bags of silver to invest and I've earned two more. 
And the master said, well, you know, that's, that's all right. Not as good as the guy who did five, but you did all right. You know, pats him on the head, says, all right, fine, you're in. No, the master, notice that the master gives him the same words and the same commendation as the one he gave the most resources to. The master said, well done, my good and faithful servant. You've been faithful in handling this small amount <coughs> in between, you know, I go <coughs> when I hear the small amount because it's a fortune. So now I will give you many more responsibilities. Let's celebrate together. Some of you guys are, are, the way you memorized it or learned it was come and share in your master's happiness. But Jesus is saying, let's celebrate together. So part of the reward, one of the rewards is more responsibility, but the second reward is celebrating together with Jesus. There was a famous missionary in India. Her name was Amy Carmichael. She, uh, she said a lot of wonderful things. The one quote that I remember from her was she said, you know what? We're going to have all eternity to celebrate our victories that we won for Jesus here on earth. We'll have all eternity to celebrate those victories, but we only have a few moments in which to win them. We only have a few moments in which to win them. So make your life count. So there's the, there's the reward that the two servant got, right? They got the same reward, even though they received different amounts of money. The reward was based on their faithfulness, not on the size of their responsibility. The smallest task in God's work, and you may say, hey, a two talent, five talent, one talent, I may get, I think I got like a point oh two talent, right? So what, what, what am I supposed to do with that? God didn't seem to give me very much. And Jesus says this in Matthew's uh, gospel when he's talking about uh, blessing those who are out doing the work of the kingdom. Jesus says, and if anyone gives even a cup of cold water to these little ones, because he is my disciple, Jesus says, I tell you the truth, he will certainly not lose his reward. Even a cup of cold water given in Jesus' name for God's work is not going to lose its reward. So there's no task too small uh, to count in the kingdom of God. So the master's reward, he commends them for doubling their talents. He gives them more responsibility and they get to celebrate with Jesus. Now here's the point of what I'm trying to, to get across here. You and I are given all of these talents, right? Whether it's intelligence, resources, giftings, abilities, opportunities, whatever those talents can all be encapsulated in this definition. We are to use your unique personality and abilities. You're to use the resources, use the intelligence, use the abilities, use the opportunities, however you encounter them, at whatever level that God gives you in those areas. You're to use those to take great risks for God and here's the reward, and, and this is so interesting. Here's the reward. The more talents and resources you invest for God's glory, the more God is going to give you. The more you use, the more God will give you. You cannot outspend God in, the, in, this, in these kingdom accounts. More is going to give you. When you risk something, when you step forward for God, you risk rejection sometimes. You risk failure. You risk falling on your face. In some places and, and, and areas of the world, you risk persecution when you stand up for Jesus and your culture and your society and your environment. Whenever you're doing that, you are risking something. But the point is, the risk is worth the reward because the reward is going to be with the Lord Jesus. Now, the, the only mistake here, because God says, you know, use this until I come back and then you're going to give an accounting. The only real mistake here is to not risk making a mistake by letting fear paralyze you. Then you're saying, hey, I don't want to lose this, so I'm not going to risk. I'm not going to try anything. I'm not going to risk anything for God because I don't want to fall flat on my face. That kind of fear, that kind of not being willing to risk anything, that is going to get you in trouble with the master. And that was the fate, the tragic fate of the one talent servant. So look what he says about the third servant. Then the servant with the one bag of silver came and said, Master, I knew you were a harsh man, harvesting crops you didn't plant and gathering crops you didn't cultivate. I was afraid I would lose your money, and so I hid it in the earth. But look, here is your money back. It was very common in the first century. You don't want to lose something, 
go find a secret place out in a field, out in the country somewhere. Of course, you have to remember where you put it, right? But, but you, you have to go find a secret place and dig a hole, bury your money, and then nobody gets to it. Nobody can rob the bank. No, you know, wherever you had, nobody can look under your mattress like they did in the Depression days uh, and find the money that you've, you've stowed away. So he's thinking in some ways he's playing it safe. I don't want to lose this talent that, that the master gave me, and, and I fear I'm going to lose it, and I, he's a super hard master, so I'm just going to go and bury it. That was this guy's attitude. Now, this guy, this third servant made so many mistakes. I just want to point out a, a few of them. First of all, the master, he calls his master a hard man or a harsh man. Now, if you heard that word spoken about you, you would be offended because that was an insulting word. That means somebody is unsympathetic, is unfeeling, is uncaring. They, they're given something. They don't give back. They do not return good for good received. They take. They're takers, not givers. That was an insult. And he's actually blaming his own lack of putting to use what the master had given him. He's, he's blaming that on the master's character. He's saying the master's character, that's the reason that I didn't do anything. That's the reason why I didn't invest your money. So he's insulting the master. That's not a good way to uh, answer somebody to whom you're accountable and who has the future in your hand. <laughs> you probably don't want to start off with an insult, but he did that. So he said that. He called him a hard man. And then he said, I was afraid. I was afraid. Now, when, when he said that, my first thought was, he doesn't really know the master, does he? If he really knew the master, he knew that the master had put an amazing amount of confidence in him by handing him a 50, 60, 70 pound bag of silver coins that's worth multiple years of wages. That's a lot of confidence to put into somebody that you say you don't even like or trust. So he gave him all of this and he showed that he didn't really know his master. And that's why he said, I was afraid. 365 times, by the way. How many people say, I'm afraid of God? I fear, you know, fearing, I want to talk about fearing God, but when they say, I'm afraid, I'm afraid of God, I'm afraid he's going to punish me. I'm afraid he's going to give me uh, something bad for something good. I'm afraid that God isn't really uh, loving me or caring for me or blessing me. Though that's indicative of somebody who doesn't really know what the Bible teaches or what the scriptures tell us about the love and the mercy of God, that God loves us so much that he gave his one and only son, Jesus, for us. He gave his life to die on a cross so that we could have our sins forgiven. God looked upon us in absolute love and he said, you know what your biggest need is? Your biggest need is to be reconciled to the living God. And the only way you're going to be reconciled is by having your sins forgiven. You can't forgive your own own sins, you have to be punished for your sins. So only somebody who comes along who can take away your sins and receive the punishment for your sins, that's the person who really cares about you more than anybody else because that's the person that can actually wipe your slate clean and give you a fresh start before God and his name is Jesus. That's the master that we need to know, not the master that we're afraid of. He, so instead, because of fear, he buried, he hid that which was entrusted to him. Now that's, that's a sad testimony about somebody's life. And I would say to this, I'd say in, in Jesus, in choosing you to be his follower, if you're a follower of Jesus, he's chosen you and you're in his family. That means that he's entrusting a lot to you. He's investing in your life. And he says, I'm going to bless you so that you can be a blessing to other people. And I want you to go out and do something good with what I've given you. Multiply what I've entrusted to you. So here's the point. Don't waste what Jesus entrusts to you. He wants you to receive all of his love and his grace and his mercy. And he's entrusted you with all these abilities, resources, opportunities. He wants you to use all that to go out and make a difference in this world and go out and reconcile this world to his son Jesus, to bless other people, help them find new life in Christ. Don't waste what Jesus has entrusted with you because it's not just laziness. Some, sometimes it's just laziness. Sometimes people say, oh, I just don't feel like going out and risking anything or doing anything for God. I'm just going to sit here and wait my time. And, you know, I said a prayer when I was... 12 years old to receive Christ and I'm just going to wait it out and because you know once saved always saved hey I'm always I'm always going to be there anyway 
I'm not going to talk about salvation versus reward because I think this, this story that Jesus is telling, I think it's mostly talking about reward. But he says we can be lazy and we can miss the boat of what God has for us. We can be distracted. I, I think in our culture today, it's not just that we're lazy sometimes, it's that we're distracted. We are the kind of people that will take our God-given talents and will use them in other things. Instead of investing in the kingdom, we'll, we'll give our best talents and time and energy towards something else that doesn't really matter. That's something that doesn't honor our master, something that doesn't make a difference in the kingdom of God. And we lose our focus when we stop seeking first, first, first priority, the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And that's why this third servant is in such trouble with the master. And the master has no kind words for him, by the way. It, look what it says in verse 26. These are some sad words, and I don't have any joy in relaying them to you. But the master replied to this third servant, you wicked and lazy servant. If you knew I harvested crops that I didn't plan and gathered crops that I didn't cultivate, in other words, if what the bad you thought, character that you thought I was, if that was really true, then you should have at least deposited my money in the bank. At least I could have gotten some interest on it. And instead, you just took what I gave you and you buried it. That wicked and lazy servant could not evade responsibility for ignoring the talent that was given to him. Whether it was laziness or idleness, either way was in some way of re a rejection of God and his authority. Burying the talent in the ground is an illustration of using God's, of using God-given gifts for other means, for only earthly pursuits. So here's my third observation. You can't cling to God's love and mercy and resources and giving. It was given to you, but it's not given to you to be a depository. It's given to you to be a channel so that you can pass it on to other people. So you can't cling to all of the, the, the love and the wisdom and mercy that he's brought to you. You have to go out and spend them. To him or to her who has, more will be given. But to him or her who does not have, even the little that they have will be taken away. Because if you refuse to do the king's business, God's business, the way he wants it done, even the little you have, Jesus said, is going to be taken away. Look at what um, my mom, she's got a great, uh, she has a great spiritual math. She had it on the wall in the bathroom. And I, it's kind of crude to say it, but going to her house and going into the bathroom, I always saw this on the wall. And it's called, it was the spiritual math. And it was something that she crocheted. And she said it this way. She said, love adds and multiplies as we divide it with others. Love adds and multiplies as we divide it with others. When you give because God has given to you, you don't lose what you give. When you give and you pass out and you distribute and you bless other people with what God gives you, he keeps putting more into your account. You cannot outgive God. It's like they, they say it in financial giving. You say, you can't outgive God. He has a bigger wallet, right? So, but you can't outgive God in your talents and time and resources and energy either because he's always going to replenish you and he's always going to give you more. Max Lucado writes this about this story. He says, consider the, the reaction of the third servant. Contrast what he did with what the first two servants did. The faithful, the first two faithful servants, they went out and traded. The third servant went out and dug. The first two went out and invested. The last servant went out and buried. The first two went out on a limb. The third servant hugged the trunk. He made the most tragic and common mistake of, of God's giftedness. He failed to benefit the master with his talent. So just to give a recap. This is a recap. This is in your bulletin. If you fill in the blanks. But I've said this before in the message, and I, I just want to bring it to your attention one more time. Number one, with responsibility, because Jesus is entrusting us. These talents were huge bags full of years' wages of money. Whether it was five bags or two bags or one bag, it was an incredibly uh, valuable amount of resources that the master was entrusting to each one of these. 
And he says, with responsibility given to you by your master Jesus comes accountability. You and I have the freedom to do whatever we want to do, but we will be held accountable for our choices. Number two, for the faithful servant, no award ceremony out there comes even close to hearing well done by our master Jesus. So if you make that your only aim in life, I just want to get to the end of my life and face the Lord Jesus, my Savior, my Redeemer, my Lord, my Master, the one who's been with me ever since the day I said yes to following him because he said, I'll never leave you or forsake you. I just want to hear those words come out of his mouth. Well done, right? Unfortunately, not everyone is going to hear those words because the third observation is this, that the one who clings to, the one who tries to keep it all to yourself, the one who buries the talents that God gives you, the master's evaluation is harsh. Look what it says in verse 28. Then the master ordered, then the master ordered, take the money from this servant, give it to the one with the two bags of 10, excuse me, 10 bags. Remember he had five, then he earned five more, now he has 10. The one who had the one bag, the, the, he didn't have as hardly any as much. The other guy now has, the middle guy has four bags of silver. The, the guy given the most responsibility now has 10 bags of silver. And the guy who had the one bag, he says, take it away from him and give it over to the guy who has the 10 bags of silver. And everybody's listening to this. I'm sure the, the audience is probably like this going, what are you doing? Why are you giving the one who has the least to the one who has the most? Because look what Jesus says, to those who use well what they are given, even more will be given, and they will have an abundance. But to those who do nothing, even what little they have will be taken away. The one who has little and refuses to use it, but just buries it in the ground, that person is going to lose even what little she or he had. And that is the saddest part. That is the tr most tragic part of the story. The wise use of gifts and abilities entrusted to us gives us even more opportunities. But the neglect of our abilities not only results in the loss of more opportunities, it results in the loss of even what was originally entrusted to us. And so now the, the tragic fate of the servant. Now throw that, use, the, that useless servant into outer darkness where there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And I'm trying to understand that, what that was meaning and the most likely meaning portrayed, this is my opinion here, is that that person forfeits whatever reward they would have received for committed service in the kingdom. They have a great loss of joy. And that loss of joy, the loss of what they could have had if they'd been faithful, results in a weeping and gnashing of teeth. It reflects the remorse that a person's going to have for their lost opportunities. And I, I'll say it this way. I put it in, the, in, in street language. I said, you had an, un, you had an unbelievable opportunity here. And you blew it. You squandered it. Don't do that. You cannot cling to God's love and mercy and resources and gifting. You have to spend them. You have to spend them. So here it is, shopaholics in the kingdom. <laughs> Go out and spend it. Go out and spend as liberally as you can the love of God that he lavished on you. And you'll soon find out that there's even more love and grace and mercy and opportunities that are going to be put into your spiritual bank account. Amen? Amen. Amen. I'm going to invite the choir to come on up and sing a closing song for us. And I just want us to all bow our heads for a moment for a word of prayer. God, our gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we want to value, we want to esteem every word that comes out from your glorious Son, Jesus. Every word he says is true. Every word he says is eternal. He said, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. And so, Lord, he was the one who said these words. When the time comes and we've fulfilled our responsibilities and we've done what you want us to do, we've been faithful, Lord, we long to hear from your lips, well done, good and faithful servant. Lord, you've blessed us in so many ways. You've given us so many opportunities, abilities, and resources, Lord. Help us to remember the reason why you bless us. 
Not so we can hoard it for ourselves. Not so we can bury it in the ground. But Lord, so that we can turn and invest your resources in order to bless other people, to reach them with the love of God and the saving grace of Jesus Christ. Lord, help us to remember our responsibility to you, knowing that one day each one of us is going to stand before you and we're going to give you an account of the life that we lived. God, help us to invest the talents you entrusted to us. Lord, we love you because you loved us first. Thank you for loving and pouring out your blessings to us. And Lord, please, if there's somebody in here today and all they can think about is fear right now or they're thinking about disappointment or they're thinking maybe, God, maybe I'm the third servant. Please, Father, give them the faith. Give them the confidence. Give them the, the reassurance that it's never too late to turn around and start doing the right thing. And Lord, give them faith and confidence that the first two servants have so that we, from this day forward, we can all go out immediately and be investing lavishly in your kingdom work. God, help us to do that for your honor and your praise and your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people agreed together and said, Amen. Amen.